This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 4. An Elephant Hunt now, I do not propose to narrate at full length all the incidents of our long travel up to Setanda's Corral, near the junction of the Lukanga and Kalukwe rivers. It was a journey of more than a thousand miles from Durban, the last three hundred or so of which we had to make on foot, owing to the frequent presence of the dreadful tsetse fly, whose bite is fatal to all animals except donkeys and men. We left Durban at the end of January, and it was in the second week of May that we camped near Satanda's Corral. Our adventures on the way were many and various, but as they are of the sort which befall every African hunter, with one exception to be presently detailed, I shall not set them down here, lest I should render this history too wearisome. At Inyati, the outlying trading station in the Matabele country, of which Lobinbula, a great and cruel scoundrel, is king, with many regrets we parted from our comfortable wagon. Only twelve oxen remained to us out of the beautiful span of twenty which I had bought at Durban. One we lost from the bite of a cobra, three had perished from poverty and the want of water, one strayed, and the other three died from eating the poisonous herb called tulip. Five more sickened from this cause, but we managed to cure them with doses of an infusion made by boiling down the tulip leaves. If administered in time, this is a very effective antidote. The wagon and the oxen we left in the immediate charge of Goza and Tom, our driver and leader, both trustworthy boys, requesting a worthy Scotch missionary who lived in this distant place to keep an eye on them. Then, accompanied by Umbopa, Kiva, Ventvogel, and half a dozen bearers whom we hired on the spot, we started off on foot upon our wild quest. I remember... We were all a little silent on the occasion of this departure, and I think that each of us was wondering if we should ever see our wagon again. For my part, I never expected to do so. For a while we tramped on in silence, till Umbopa, who was marching in front, broke into a Zulu chant about how some brave men, tired of life and the tameness of things, started off into a vast wilderness to find new things or die, and how, lo and behold, when they had traveled far into the wilderness, they found that it was not a wilderness at all, but a beautiful place, full of young wives and fat cattle, of game to hunt and enemies to kill. Then we all laughed and took it for a good omen, Umbopa was a cheerful savage in a dignified sort of way, when he was not suffering from one of his fits of brooding, and he had a wonderful knack of keeping up our spirits. We all grew very fond of him. And now for the one adventure to which I am going to treat myself, for I do dearly love a hunting yarn. About a fortnight's march from Inyati, we came across a peculiarly beautiful bit of well-watered woodland country. The kloofs in the hills were covered with dense bush, idoro bush as the natives call it, and in some places with the little wachin becha, or wait a little thorn, and there were great quantities of the lovely machabel tree, laden with refreshing yellow fruit having enormous stones. This tree is the elephant's favorite food, and there were not wanting signs that the great brutes had been about. For not only was their spoor frequent, but in many places the trees were broken down and even uprooted. The elephant is a destructive feeder. One evening, after a long day's march, we came to a spot of great loveliness. 
At the foot of a bush-clad hill lay a dry river-bed, in which, however, were to be found pools of crystal water all trodden round with the hoof-prints of game. Facing this hill was a park-like plain, which grew clumps of flat-topped mimosa, varied with occasional glossy-leaved machabels, and all round stretched the sea of pathless silent bush. As we emerged into this riverbed path, suddenly we started a troop of tall giraffes who galloped, or rather sailed off, in their strange gait, their tails screwed up over their backs, and their hoofs rattling like castanets. They were about three hundred yards from us, and therefore practically out of shot, but Good, who was walking ahead, and who had an express loaded with solid ball in his hand, could not resist temptation. Lifting his gun, he let drive at the last a young cow. By some extraordinary chance, the ball struck it full on the back of the head, shattering the spinal column, and that giraffe went rolling head over heels just like a rabbit. I never saw a more curious thing. "'Curse it!' said Good, for I am sorry to say he had a habit of using strong language when excited. Contracted, no doubt, in the course of his nautical career. Curse it, I've killed him. Oh, Bougouin, ejaculated the Kaffirs. Oh, oh. They called good Bougouin, or glass eye, because of his glass eye. Oh, Bougouin, re-echoed Sir Henry and I, and from that day Good's reputation as a marvelous shot was established. At any rate, among the Kaffirs... Really, he was a bad one, but whenever he missed, we overlooked it for the sake of that giraffe. Having set some of the boys to cut off the best of the giraffe's meat, we went to work to build a skirm near one of the pools and about a hundred yards to its right. This is done by cutting a quantity of thorn bushes and piling them in the shape of a circular hedge. Then the space enclosed is smoothed and dry tambuki grass, if obtainable, is made into a bed in the center, and a fire or fires lighted. By the time the skirm was finished, the moon peeped up, and our dinners of giraffe steaks and roasted marrow bones were ready. How we enjoyed those marrow bones, though it was rather a job to crack them. I know of no greater luxury than giraffe marrow, unless it is elephant's heart and we had that on the morrow. We ate our simple meal by the light of the moon, pausing at times to thank Good for his wonderful shot. Then we began to smoke and yarn. And a curious picture we must have made squatting there around the fire. I, with my short grizzled hair sticking up straight, and Sir Henry with his yellow locks, which were getting rather long, were rather a contrast especially as I am thin and short and dark, weighing only nine stone and a half, and Sir Henry is tall and broad and fair and weighs fifteen. But perhaps the most curious looking of the three, taking all the circumstances of the case into consideration, was Captain John Good, R.N. There he sat upon a leather bag, looking just as though he had come in from a comfortable day's shooting in a civilized country, absolutely clean, tidy, and well-dressed. He wore a shooting suit of brown tweed, with a hat to match, and neat gaiters. As usual, he was beautifully shaved. His eyeglass and his false teeth appeared to be in perfect order, and altogether he looked the neatest man I have ever had to do with in the wilderness. He even sported a collar, of which he had a supply, made of white gutta percha. "'You see, they weigh so little,' he said to me innocently, when I expressed my astonishment at the fact. "'And I always like to turn out like a gentleman.' "'Ah, if he could have foreseen the future, and the raiment prepared for him. "'Well, there we three sat, yarning away in the beautiful moonlight, "'and watching the Kaffirs a few yards off, "'sucking their intoxicating daka from a pipe.' of which the mouthpiece was made of the horn of an eland, till one by one 
they rolled themselves up in their blankets and went to sleep by the fire, that is, all except Umbopa, who was a little apart, his chin resting on his hand and thinking deeply. I noticed that he never mixed much with the other Kaffirs. Presently, from the depths of the bush behind us, came a loud, Woof! Woof! That's a lion, said I, and we all started up to listen. Hardly had we done so, when from the pool about a hundred yards off, we heard the strident trumpeting of an elephant. Ungungu glovo! And glovo! Elephant! Elephant! whispered the Kaffirs and a few minutes afterwards we saw a succession of vast shadowy forms moving slowly from the direction of the water towards the bush. Up jumped Good, burning for slaughter, and thinking, perhaps, that it was as easy to kill Elephant as he had found it to shoot Giraffe, but I caught him by the arm and pulled him down. "'It's no good,' I whispered. "'Let them go.' "'It seems that we are in a paradise of game.' I vote we stop here for a day or two and have a go at them, said Sir Henry presently. I was rather surprised, for hitherto Sir Henry had always been for pushing forward as fast as possible, more especially since we ascertained at Inyati that about two years ago an Englishman of the name of Neville had sold his wagon there and gone on up country, but I suppose his hunter instincts got the better of him for a while. Good jumped at the idea, for he was longing to have a shot at those elephants. And so, to speak the truth, did I, for it went against my conscience to let such a herd as that escape without a pull at them. "'All right, my hearties,' said I. "'I think we want a little recreation. And now let's turn in, for we ought to be off by dawn, and then perhaps we may catch them feeding before they move on.' The others agreed, and we proceeded to make our preparations. Good took off his clothes, shook them, put his eyeglass and his false teeth into his trousers pocket, and folding each article neatly, placed it out of the dew under a corner of his Macintosh sheet. Sir Henry and I contented ourselves with rougher arrangements, and soon were curled up in our blankets and dropping off into the dreamless sleep that rewards the traveler. Going, going, go, what was that? Suddenly, from the direction of the water, came sounds of violent scuffling, and next instant there broke upon our ears a succession of the most awful roars. There was no mistaking their origin. Only a lion could make such a noise as that. We all jumped up and looked towards the water, in the direction of which we saw a confused mass yellow and black in color, staggering and struggling towards us. We seized our rifles, and slipping on our veltschoons, that is, shoes made of untanned hide, ran out of the skirm. By this time the mass had fallen, and was rolling over and over on the ground, and when we reached the spot it struggled no longer, but lay quite still. Now we saw what it was. On the grass there lay a sable antelope bull, the most beautiful of all the African antelopes, quite dead, and transfixed by its great curved horns was a magnificent black maned lion, also dead. Evidently what had happened was this. The sable antelope had come down to drink at the pool where the lion, no doubt the same which we had heard, was lying in wait. While the antelope drank, the lion had sprung upon him, only to be received upon the sharp, curved horns and transfixed. Once before I saw a similar thing happen. Then the lion, unable to free himself, had torn and bitten at the back and neck of the bull, which, maddened with fear and pain, had rushed on until it dropped dead. As soon as we had examined the beast sufficiently, we called the Kaffirs, and between us managed to drag their carcasses up to the skirm. After that we went in and lay down, to wake no more till dawn. With the first light we were up and making ready for the fray. 
we took with us the three eight-bore rifles, a good supply of ammunition, and our large water bottles filled with weak cold tea, which I have always found the best stuff to shoot on. After swallowing a little breakfast, we started, Umbopa, Kiva, and Ventvogel accompanying us. The other Kaffirs we left with instructions to skin the lion and the sable antelope and cut up the latter. We had no difficulty in finding the broad elephant trail which Ventvogel, after examination, pronounced to have been made by between twenty and thirty elephants, most of them full-grown bulls. But the herd had moved on some way during the night, and it was nine o'clock and already very hot, before, by the broken trees, bruised leaves and bark, and smoking droppings, we knew that we could not be far from them. Presently we caught sight of the herd, which numbered, as Vent Vogel had said, between twenty and thirty, standing in a great hollow, having finished their morning meal, and flapping their great ears. It was a splendid sight, for they were only about two hundred yards from us. Taking a handful of dry grass, I threw it into the air to see how the wind was. For if once they winded us, I knew they would be off before we could get a shot. Finding that, if anything, it blew from the elephants to us, we crept on stealthily, and thanks to the cover, managed to get within forty yards or so of the great brutes. Just in front of them, and broadside on, stood three splendid bulls one of them with enormous tusks. I whispered to the other that I would take the middle one, Sir Henry covering the elephant to the left, and Good, the bull with the big tusks. Now, I whispered. Boom, 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 went the three heavy rifles, and down came Sir Henry's elephant dead as a hammer, shot right through the heart. Mine fell onto its knees, and I thought, that he was going to die, but in another moment he was up and off, tearing along straight past me. As he went, I gave him the second barrel in the ribs, and this brought him down in good earnest. Hastily slipping in two fresh cartridges, I ran close to him, and the ball through the brain put an end to the poor brute's struggles. Then I turned to see how good had fared with the big bull which I had heard screaming with rage and pain as I gave mine its quietus. On reaching the captain, I found him in a great state of excitement. It appeared that on receiving the bullet, the bull had turned and come straight for his assailant, who had barely time to get out of his way, and then charged on blindly past him in the direction of our encampment. Meanwhile, the herd had crashed off in wild alarm in the other direction. For a while we debated whether to go after the wounded bull or to follow the herd, and finally deciding for the latter alternative, departed, thinking that we had seen the last of those big tusks. I have often wished since that we had. It was easy work to follow the elephants, for they had left a trail like a carriage road behind them, crushing down the thick bush in their furious flight as though it were tambuki grass. But to come up with them was another matter, and we had struggled on under the broiling sun for over two hours before we found them. With the exception of one bull, they were standing together, and I could see from their unquiet way and the manner in which they kept lifting their trunks to test the air that they were on the lookout for mischief. The solitary bull stood fifty yards or so to this side of the herd, over which he was evidently keeping sentry, and about sixty yards from us. Thinking that he would see or wind us, and that it would probably start them off again if we tried to get nearer, especially as the ground was rather open, we all aimed at this bull, and at my whispered word we fired. The three shots took effect, and down he went dead. Again the herd started, but unfortunately for them, about a hundred yards further on was a nula, or dried-out water track, with steep banks. 
a place very much resembling the one where the Prince Imperial was killed in Zululand. Into this the elephants plunged, and when we reached the edge we found them struggling in wild confusion to get up the other bank, filling the air with their screams and trumpeting as they pushed one another aside in their selfish panic, just like so many human beings. Now was our opportunity, and firing away as quickly as we could load, we killed five of the poor beasts, and no doubt should have bagged the whole herd had they not suddenly given up their attempts to climb the bank and rushed headlong down the nullah. We were too tired to follow them, and perhaps also a little sick of slaughter, eight elephants being a pretty good bag for one day. So after we were rested a little, and the Kafirs had cut out the hearts of two of the dead elephants for supper, we started homewards, very well pleased with our day's work, having made up our minds to send the bearers on the morrow to chop away the tusks. Shortly after we repassed the spot where Good had wounded the patriarchal bull, we came across a herd of Eland, but did not shoot at them as we had plenty of meat. They trotted past us and then stopped behind a little patch of bush about a hundred yards away, wheeling round to look at us. As Good was anxious to get a near view of them, never having seen an Eland close, he handed his rifle to Umbopa, and followed by Kiva, strolled up to the patch of bush. We sat down and waited for him, not sorry of the excuse for a little rest. The sun was just going down in its reddest glory, and Sir Henry and I were admiring the lovely scene, when suddenly we heard an elephant scream, and saw its huge and rushing form, with uplifted trunk and tail, silhouetted against the great fiery globe of the sun. Next second we saw something else, and that was Good and Kiva, tearing back towards us with the wounded bull, for it was he, charging after them. For a moment we did not dare to fire, though at that distance it would have been of little use if we had done so, for fear of hitting one of them. And the next a dreadful thing happened. Good fell, a victim to his passion for civilized dress. Had he consented to discard his trousers and gaiters like the rest of us, and to hunt in a flannel shirt and pair of velt shoes, it would have been all right. But as it was, his trousers cumbered him in that desperate race, and presently, when he was about sixty yards from us, his boot, polished by the dry grass, slipped, and down he went on his face right in front of the elephant. We gave a gasp, for we knew that he must die, and ran as hard as we could towards him. In three seconds it had ended, but not as we thought. Kiva, the Zulu boy, saw his master fall, and brave lad as he was, turned and flung his assegai straight into the elephant's face. It stuck in his trunk. With a scream of pain, the brute seized the poor Zulu, hurled him to the earth, and placing one huge foot onto his body about the middle, twined its trunk round his upper part and tore him in two. We rushed up mad with horror, and fired again and again, till presently the elephant fell upon the fragments of the Zulu. As for good, he rose and wrung his hands over the brave man who had given his life to save him, and though I am an old hand, I felt a lump grow in my throat. Umbopa stood contemplating the huge dead elephant, and the mangled remains of poor Kiva. Ah, well, he said presently, he's dead, but he died like a man. End of chapter 4